All right, so we're gonna get started with our languages and systems track. So my name is Michael Carbon. Uh, I lead the programming systems group here at MIT, and I feel very privileged to be here today to actually chair this session on language and systems, which is going to highlight you know, some of the efforts that are going on in the programming languages and systems community you know, in and around probabilistic programming, you know, machine learning, and inference. Uh, and I'm also excited to announce our keynote speaker today. Um, this is John Tristan. Uh, he is actually received his PhD uh, from INRIA, uh, working on the project of actually on CompCert. So then CompCert was a major effort coming from the program languages and systems community on um, building a verified compiler from C down to assembly code. Right, where verified there means that you can actually verify that the, XX, that the assembly code that you generate matches the semantics of that C program. Uh, since then, John has worked on a variety of different compilation and verification projects, um, including stints at Microsoft Research in Paris, um, as well as Harvard. And now more recently at Oracle, uh, he's actually been working on compilation in the context of problems to programs, and even now more broadly, as he's moved on to take uh, the role of lead of core research in the machine learning research group, uh, he's actually broadened his efforts and looked at issues such as computational learning theory. So I'm happy to introduce John for us today. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> All right. So given that I have, uh, I think, a foot in the uh, each of the two communities, PL and machine learning, I figured that I would try to give a talk that would have a message for both. And so when it comes to uh, a message for uh, uh, my friends from machine learning, I think what I would like to try to argue in the, the amount of time that I have is that uh, compilers are really fascinating and that there is a lot, uh, uh, there's been a lot of research, more than 60 years of research in compiler. And there are a lot of principles, many of which are very interesting and are good to keep in mind when we uh, attack the problem of compiling prostic programs. And on the other hand, uh, um, I would like in this talk to go through a very simple example of a, a compilation problem that is very typical of uh, prostic programming, something that we, is completely different from what we're used to in the, in the world of, of PL. So, before I start, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about compilers, so I think I should just spend like a minute to clarify the difference between a compiler and an interpreter. At a very high level, um, an interpreter is, is a program that simulates another program, and a compiler is, is a program that is going to take a program in some language and do some transformation offline and produce something else. So for example, it takes a C program, does some work and outputs an assembly code, a piece of assembly code once and for all. So what I'm interested in here is the second one. I'm interested in compilers. And, and I think sometimes uh, uh, there is a little bit of confusion between the two, which is not unfair because the, the, the boundary is actually somewhat fuzzy. But uh, hopefully at that point uh, in the conference, given that you paid to be here, and uh, we've had several keynotes already that talk about prostate programming, I assume that you agree that uh, you're on board with the idea that it's potentially useful. Uh, what I want to ask is, why should we care about compiling the prostate programs? And I think it's a fair question, because writing an interpreter, uh, to some extent, is much easier. And so, do we really need to care nowadays about a compiler? What do we get of compilation? Because if the idea is that we're going to get a two or three times speed up, is it worth it? Uh, but actually, I have some anecdotal evidence that it is really worth the effort. So in 2013, uh, uh, um, colleagues and I uh, at Oracle started to design a, a language called Augur. And the idea was to do map inference for uh, Bayesian networks, but in such a way that the code would be compiled down to GPU. We wanted to be able to run everything on the GPU. Now, once we were done building this uh, uh, prototype, we, uh, one of the first programs we wrote was LDA. And when we run LDA, uh, we got results that compare like this. I don't want to give too hard numbers because I'm comparing apples and potatoes, but um, <coughs> or I guess maybe apples or no, bananas, <laughs> some fruit. But uh, so with Augur, which is compiled, um, we could actually run LDA on uh, some fraction of Wikipedia with less than one gigabyte in less than 20 minutes on the GPU. Uh, we're using other systems, 
uh, were using, for example, factory, and you could run LDA with factory, it was interpreted, but it would take more than six hours, but on the CPU. So note that it's really an unfair comparison, right? Because, but the point that is important here is that if, you, uh, uh, if your goal is to use a GPU, then uh, uh, going the interpreter route is difficult because you could definitely write an interpreter on a GPU for prostic programs, but it would be very difficult to make good use of a GPU that way. You're really better off actually uh, trying to uh, build a compiler. Um, another interesting example is that we ran JAX, uh, one of the implementation of bugs, and uh, it's interpreted as well, and in this case, it failed. It failed because it was using more than 120 gig of RAM, and that's the amount of RAM we had available on the machine where we did our tests. And I think I'll come back to this, because it's interesting. It highlights one of the subtle differences between doing interpreter and a compiler. So as I said uh, uh, earlier, there's been a lot of work on compilers. And I actually think that compiler engineering is a very principled trade. And uh, if you look at a, one of the classic textbook in compiler engineering, like the Dragon Book or the Tiger Book, you'll see that um, uh, uh, there is a lot of agreement about how we should organize a compiler. So here are some of these uh, uh, principles. When it comes to the architecture, it's very common when you have to uh, build a compiler to actually uh, use a pipeline of well-defined transformation and analysis. Right? So a compiler isn't a big blob that goes straight from C to assembly like it used to maybe in the 70s, but nowadays it's really a sequence of a very well-defined transformation. For example, let's say you have a language with first class function. We know a list of transformation that can help you compile them. Uh, so if you, have closure if you have first class functions, maybe you want to use closure conversion and we know very well how to address this problem. If your uh, machine has registers, uh, there are a list of well-known algorithms like register allocation that you can use to actually uh, uh, produce code for registers, etc. We even have a fair amount of theory to help us design new analysis like abstract interpretation. The other interesting thing is that not only we have a well-defined sequence and transformation, but we actually go from uh, um, this transformation, keep transforming the representation of the program, and typically these representations are well understood, and a lot of effort has been placed into designing them. So for example, there are the abstract syntax tree, which is usually what you get out of a parser, but another example is static single assignment, which is a, a somewhat famous representation for programs, which uh, is particularly useful for some optimizations. Finally, uh, typically, these intermediate representation have very well-defined semantics. And it's important because it turns out that for compilers, we have a pretty good idea of what it means for a compiler to be correct. Um, for example, you might say what we want is that if you give me a program, and this program has some behavior, uh, uh, we usually say some semantics, and I actually formalize the semantics, I want to make sure that as my program is being transformed, the semantics of my program is being preserved. And um, in fact, we can actually do this, and like Michael mentioned, uh, in the Comster project, we actually produce an entirely uh, um, a, a proof that can be mechanically verified that a C compiler preserves the semantics of the program. So this is actually an example coming from uh, Comster for, that, I, that I took from the Comster website, where you can see that really this is not just one blob. We have all of these well-defined transformations. If you look at the first one, just the first one, otherwise it's overwhelming, but it's basically you start with something that's close to C, and the first transformation that we have is very simple. All it does, it takes the side effect in the expressions and remove them. Right? You take the, uh, any side effect is actually become its own statement. And this is convenient because it means that later on in the compiler, when you deal with an expression, you know that there are no side effects and it's referred to really transparent, which means that you can actually treat it as in mathematics and do rewriting uh, uh, with it. And that gives us a new language, c uh, which has a somewhat slightly simpler semantics than what we started with. So this is how we actually build these compilers. And when we started to work on this project for Augur, one of the questions we had is, well, if we actually try to, if we consider the fact that we have all these design principles, how should it guide our work for prosthetic programming, right? So for example, we, we asked, what are the key transformations? In a sense, uh, it's very much like the opposite of what David Bly was talking about yesterday, right? He was talking about black box transformation. And here, uh, what we want to do is white box transformation. We actually want to know what the program is. We want to analyze automatically the program to try to 
produce the best possible code. And both goals, I think, are, are worth studying. So for example, one, uh, uh, one thing you could study is how do you derive deep samplers? Uh, there is also the question of how to represent the intermediate results. When I looked at the work around 2013, I felt like in many cases, like the representation of the program wasn't always clearly specified. And sometimes, actually, the representation was chosen in such a way that would prevent producing high quality code. Uh, another thing that's potentially interesting for compiler hackers is that there are a lot of optimizations in prostate programming that we're not used to in compilers. A lot of papers at NIPS and ICML are about uh, uh, finding an estimator for some value, uh, which actually lets you uh, uh, scale. And so to some extent, many of these approximation or estimation that we do could be automated, and that's potentially very interesting. And finally, so this question uh, is really something that I find interesting, is what would it mean for a prostic program compiler to be correct? Because clearly here, the notion of, of correctness is going to be very different. So the pipeline of Augur at a very high level was this, where we started from some language that here is described as BN, and we had some parsing. And the parsing is uh, not interesting uh, at all in this case. Uh, it's a very typical parser. We produce some uh, abstract syntax, then we have the Gibbs analysis, and we continue our way in this pipeline, doing some statistical optimization, memory optimization, and finally the code generation to produce CUDA code. So what I want to do now is to go through some of these steps to actually just try to, at a high level, say why we made the design, the choices that, that we did, and uh, uh, where are the interesting uh, problems. The first step when you build a compiler is to have a pretty good idea of what is it you're compiling. So what I like to do is to use the, uh, um, uh, I like to think in terms of, of the language classification, and I feel like it's convenient to think that when it comes to prolistic programming languages, there are three dimensions of expressiveness. Uh, one of them is what exactly is the language for the models, right? And so, so far in these two days, we've talked a lot about Turing complete languages to express the models, but there are other choices. There are more domain specific, like conditional random fields, which you have like in factory, or uh, Bayesian networks like we had in, in bugs. There's also a language for the query, uh, uh, because you, can, you could ask many different questions about your program. In fact, that actually leads to a lot of misunderstanding between PL and machine learning papers, because often in PL, the only query they care about is running the program forward. Right? And it's, it's a fair query, but there are other uh, uh, queries you could ask. And finally, there's the question of the inference. How are we going to do the inference? And it's also a pretty interesting dimension, because in some cases, like bugs or infer.net, uh, uh, basically, this is chosen for you. But in other cases, like, I guess, Edward, you are provided with a lot of power to actually say how you want to do the inference. So in our case, the modeling language are just Bayesian networks one of the simplest things you could, uh, uh, I guess, uh, want to compile. And in fact, uh, we only had a pretty fine family of distributions with known PDF and known PMFs. Uh, we only have bounded recursion, which is known at compile time. We have no conditionals, we have no functions. And this is an example of a program. This program, this very simple program, actually is a, a latent duration allocation written in five lines. So that's a very simple uh, uh, Language, but it's, it's a deceptively simple because you could actually write uh, a, a lot of the papers that you would see at NIPS or ICML, a lot of them could be written in that language. The query language is also very simple because uh, we decided that it would be fixed. Uh, here, the only choices you have are either you want to sample, so run your program forward, or actually ask a question that is a maximum a posteriori question where you say, okay, I, I'm going to condition on some data. And I want to know what our uh, uh, likely value, because everything we did was approximate, likely values for these other parameters. Uh, in fact, in this talk, I will also simplify and consider that we only assign constants to, uh, uh, when we condition, we only condition on uh, discrete variables. There is, if you know about semantics, you know there is a really good reason to do this. Um, and, Finally, for the inference, we had a few choices. Uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of expressiveness. We actually provided a few possibilities. There was Metropolis Hastings, which is fairly uninteresting, but not that useful either. Uh, uh, there is inversion to Hamilton and Monte Carlo, but the one I'll talk about today is Gibbs sampling, because it's, from a compiler perspective, it's very interesting. Uh, in case you're not familiar with it, uh, uh, very briefly, uh, Gibbs sampling works like this. Uh, say that you have a distribution over three random variables, x1, x2, x3, and you want to condition on x3, and you would like to explore x1 and x2. Uh, 
one way you could do this is you start with a random value for x1 and x2, and then you're going to repeat this process where uh, you're going to sample from x1 by conditioning on x3, which is given to you, but also the current value of x2. And then once you have a sample for x1, you're going to repeat the same thing, but this time you sample x2, given that you have the current value of x1. And you keep repeating this, and uh, we have a lot of uh, a strong theorem that tells us that under some condition, this is actually going to behave uh, very well. So you might be very disappointed at that point, right? Especially like we kept talking about powerful languages and a lot of, of really advanced AI application. And I'm talking to you about Bayesian networks, something from like the, I don't know, the 80s and fixed query and, and uh, uh, fixed inference. So maybe some of you don't even consider this to be a real plastic programming language. And maybe it's not a real one, maybe it is. I don't actually care that much. My perspective <laughs> is that one, you can actually write an awful lot of useful models in this language. Uh, models that actually, like if you actually work with data scientists day to day, many of the languages they might want to write can actually be expressed in this. And with just a few extensions like Dirichlet processes or Gaussian processes, you would knock down a huge amount of the models we deal with in practice. Uh, the other thing is that from my perspective, uh, um, we designed this language to actually study compilation. And so, uh, 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 one way I see this is that, you know, the simply type in the calculus is a wonderful language because we can understand what it means. Like, that's really the only language I understand. And uh, in a sense, like, it's good to, to look at a very simple uh, uh, pro plastic programming language to actually see what are the problems that show up when compiling. All right, so now hopefully uh, we have a better idea of what I'm trying to compile, and we can start our journey through the compiler pipeline. And as I said, the first step is totally not interesting in this case. It's just a standard parser. There is not much to say about it, except that the, what we produce is worth noticing. So what comes out of the parser is actually a piece of abstract syntax. So basically, it's just a computer representation for a program, right? The program initially is just a, 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 a sequence of ASCII character, and the parser turns this into this little, what we can think of conceptually as a tree, which is what we're going to work with uh, for the compiler. And so we have a little grammar uh, uh, with like distributions, like categorical, Dirichlet, Bernoulli, and then we can, for example, say, okay, we apply a distribution to some random variable, we condition uh, a distribution to some random variables, we can take the product, et cetera. And for example, if your input program was what I showed earlier, <coughs> that is LDA, uh, once the parser is done, we end up with a term that, that you can see at the bottom, which is product of a big multiplication from k equals 1 to k, etc. So very uninteresting, except that this is actually one of the reasons why there is already such a big difference between the performance of the compiler and the performance of JAGS. If you look at JAX closely, which by the way, JAX, I really love JAX, it's a wonderful uh, system. But uh, when we try to understand what's happening with JAX, why is it running out of memory? Well, it turns out that because it's a, a, an interpreter, the way it works is that it's actually running your program. And as it's running your program, it's actually building a graph. It's actually building the, the Bayesian network that corresponds to your program. But if you're trying to run this in Wikipedia, you end up with about, a, like, I don't know, 10 billion random variable. So that's a big, actually, graph to represent, right? And so in our case, with a compiler, what do we have? We have just a, a symbolic representation of our program, which is a few bytes, as opposed to like a fully expanded, unfolded graph that JAGS was working with. So there are pros and cons to this. The pros is that our compiler doesn't run out of memory. Uh, uh, the cons is that then the rest of the compilation process is going to be much more difficult, but also much more interesting. Also at that point, now that we have an abstract syntax, we can actually talk about semantics a little more precisely because at the level of strings, it's really difficult to talk about semantics. Um, <clears throat> so if I say that my program is pi, so it's my abstract program, and the query is q, then the semantics of a program combined with a query is a function that goes from all the unobserved variable, the variable I didn't condition on, to some probabilities. And because I define my language so simply, I can just say it's defined by induction on the abstract syntax. And for example, the meaning of uh, uh, Bernoulli of x and mu is exactly what you would expect. And if you have a product of two uh, terms, it's going to be the meaning, the product of the two meanings, et cetera. If you actually, I don't want to go over all the rules, but basically it's all pretty simple. And if you unfold all of it, if you take our LDA program, and consider its uh, abstract syntax. 
and you actually compute the semantics, which is actually fairly easy to do in this case because we have no uh, loop that with unvalid recursion, we end up with the expected density, mixed density of LDA. And once you condition, you end up with this formula, which uh, makes sense here because I said we're only conditioned on discrete variables. Okay, so that was the first thing. Now we have our, our symbolic representation from a program. And finally, we run into the first transformation, which is really specific to compiling prosthetic programs. And a, a transformation that not only I think is very interesting, but I think there is still a lot of work to be done for, to tackle this properly. So again, I want to generate a Gibbs sampler. And uh, uh, just to be clear, as I said, it means that if I have three variables, but I want to condition on one of them, I want to produce a piece of code that's going to do this, choose some values for the random variables that are not observed, and then they will keep uh, sampling in turn from each and every one of them. And by the way, we actually call all of these equations often Gibbs equations. So now, the name of the game is, I have my, my abstract syntax, I can actually find out what are the variables in there, and for all of these variables, I want to figure out, okay, what is the probability of, for example, variable phi of k given all the other ones, right? So note that's actually a huge number of them because there are many variables phi k, there are many variables theta m, there are very many variables z of m n, and clearly we have to do this symbolically over the entire families of, of uh, random variables. The way we decided to approach this is very uh, simple. Uh, we decided to try a term rewriting system. So basically, one, it's a fancy name to say that what we try to do is simulate a college student trying to derive a Gibbs sampling. So it works like this. We have our, our, uh, uh, a symbolic piece of, of abstract syntax that describes the program, and we have a bunch of rules that we're going to apply to rewrite, step by step, uh, this symbolic representation. I want to give you a few examples of these rules. The, the first one, the simplest one, is what we call the Markov Blanket Rule. You don't even need to have this rule. It could be derived from, from more primi primitive ones, but it's actually, uh, 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 it makes it easier for the, for the compiler to actually do its job. So the Markov Blanket Rule is actually what you see on the left, and it's doing some very basic probability uh, uh, calculus. And what it's doing more intuitively is represented on the right. So we don't actually have a graph, right? It's a symbolic representation, but the graph is convenient to uh, 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 convey information. If I had six random variables and I want to condition on x1 given all the others, this rule is just going to say, well, I don't actually care in this case about x6 and x4. I don't actually, I'm conditionally independent uh, uh, on these. So that's the most basic one. But then some of these rules become very interesting and somewhat complicated. So let's say, for example, that you want to compile a program that happens to represent like a mixture model or a mixed membership model. Uh, then we actually have a very specific rule for this, the mixture rule. And it says what you can see in the formula here, which is actually a complicated way to say something very simple, which is that when you have a bunch of variable, if you have a predicate, you can actually split them according to this predicate. Now, why do we do this? The reason we do this is that if you're trying to compile a mixture model, the problem you run into is that you know that at runtime, when the Gibbs sampler is working, all of the, if you consider something like LDA that has so-called latent variables, each and every one of them will have a specific value and will assign all of the data point to a specific component. So we know that will be the case, but at compile time, we have no idea who uh, who are they going to be assigned to because it's going to change at every iteration. But if we want to be able to rewrite, we do need to take this into account. So that's actually what this rule is for. This rule is helping us say, well, we don't know now at compile time how the data points are going to be assigned, but we know that they will be assigned to someone. And so we need to be able to continue formally uh, uh, with the assumption that they will be assigned and we need to continue the rewriting with this. So that's what this rule is about and it is necessary if you want to compile mixture model or mixed membership model very effectively. And note that this is an, an interesting point, extreme example of where JAGs, in JAGs everything would be much, much simpler. In JAGs they don't have to deal with that type of problems because they unfolded everything. Here's another uh, interesting rule. It's the last one I will show, I promise. Uh, it's what I call the conjugacy rule. And this was in, is interesting because it, it shows that um, if you're a compiler hacker and you want to work on prosthetic programming, well, you will have to learn a little bit of statistics. Uh, so let's say that you have a program uh, that represents a bunch of coin flips. Um, oh, interestingly, ah, what a faux pas. It's a prosthetic programming conference and I forgot the prior on my uh, little model. Um, 
So you have a bunch of coin flip, and they have some prior, right? So it's, they're all like a, a sample from a Bernoulli distribution that has some parameter, and it has, it has a prior. And so you start with the query, I want to know the probability of mu, the bias of the coin, given what I've observed. So the term rewriting system starts its work, and it applies the Markov blankets and maybe other things, and eventually ends up with this, which is, all right, it's P of mu times the big product of uh, all the Bernoullis. Fine, but now what do I do with this? I'm kind of stuck. It's a very simple expression, but how do I produce good code for, to sample from this? Well, it actually really depends on what is the type of mu. I'm using the word type very uh, informally here, but what is the distribution of mu? Right? Because if the programmer chose for the distribution of P to be beta distribution, then the compiler better know about this. And at that point, use a rewrite rule that say, well, we can actually rewrite all of this as beta of mu with some parameters, right? Because the programmer didn't choose beta at, at random. He chose this because he was expecting that uh, uh, he would be able to derive a really good Gibbs sampler out of it. So this rule is very interesting because first of all, the way it's implemented in, uh, uh, in our compiler is very ad hoc. Uh, basically, we have a, a laundry list of, of conjugacy rules saying, okay, if you have like multinomial, it corresponds to Dirichlet. But um, it's, on the one hand, it's very important because if you, can't, if you don't have such a relationship, then when you want to generate the code, you have to fall back to other things such as adaptive rejection sampling, which can be fairly effective, but probably won't be as effective as if you can actually have a closed form solution for the density. Um, so I think it's really critical to do, to do the work to actually discover them. And on top of this, it's interesting because potentially you could start thinking of tools such as IDEs where if someone, a data scientist write a program and he missed the one class where they talked about conjugate relationship and he chose from you something like a Gaussian distribution. You could actually think of a compiler that at this point would say, well, we can generate code for this if you want, but if you had chosen uh, a beta distribution instead of, of Gaussian or tr truncated Gaussian, we would be able to produce much, much better code. So these are three examples, and eventually, uh, uh, once we've done all of this rewriting, we actually find the answer to all of these questions I asked before. What is the probability of phi k given all the other variables, et cetera? Now, as we're doing this, we're also uncovering what are exactly the data structures that we will need uh, uh, to actually run this MCMC chain, uh, <laughs> MCMC. Um, the other thing is that at that point, you start to see why actually going through this effort is really valuable. Because note that um, at that point, we can actually just look at these formulas and actually realize that there are, and that actually is because of how we have to be specific about what the semantics of our input language is, but assuming that our language has some uh, uh, um, uh, uh, semantics when it comes to conditional independence, we know that all of these, or most of these by family, are independent. This is really important and critical because if they are independent, that means we can sample them in parallel. And that means we can produce code for the GPU. Because for example, we expect that the variable z of mn, we will have several billions of them. For theta m and phi k, phi k typically we won't have that many, maybe we'll have a, like a thousand. Uh, but for theta m, we might very well have, um, uh, yeah, I guess hundreds of millions. We've actually had case uh, uh, at work where we actually have, yeah, maybe even billions uh, for this one as well. And so we can actually, this is why after all of this work, uh, trying to do this white box analysis of the program, finally we've uncovered all of this parallelism that allows us to generate really high quality GPU code. So that's the final code, all right? It's very uh, uh, simple at that point. Uh, and we say, okay, in parallel, we'll sample all the FIKI, in parallel, we'll sample all the variable theta m, et cetera. And actually producing the kernels, the CUDA kernels, is fairly uninteresting, it's, it's fairly easy. So I'd like to step back a little bit and talk about, uh, again, like com compare what we've done with the compiler against what was done, uh, for example, in an interpreter like JAX. So in a compiler, because we have a symbolic representation, we decided to use term rewriting. And there are pros and cons. I'll start with the cons. The cons is that, first of all, it's kind of difficult to do. You have I, I, I'm actually somewhat unhappy about what we ended up with because it's fairly ad hoc. We have these rules like the mixture rule, et cetera, and uh, we don't really know like, okay, does this rewrite process terminate? So 
in the case of Augur, it does terminate, but we have kind of like a few hacks in there to make sure that it does. Also, like, can we characterize when it works or not? These are very typical uh, uh, programming language questions. And I think to that point, they're uh, somewhat unanswered. But also that raise questions such as, what do we do about the conjugacy relationships? Um, because as I said, we have a table, but hopefully there would be better solutions. Uh, for example, there was a paper right here, a poster, I guess, uh, I forgot the name, uh, uh, but that seemed very interesting from Google Brain about like a language that really tried to be much more principled about discovering the conjugacy relationships, which I think is very useful. Um, but as I said, once we have the equation, we can actually, this is the gateway to produce highly efficient code and also potentially parallel code and distributed code, etc. cetera. Uh, on the other hand of the spectrum, the interpreter, the big advantage is that it's really trivial to do, but the price to pay is that now you have a very expensive local view of the program where uh, when you want to do the Gibbs sampling, you have one variable, you can just look at the dependency, you can very easily say, oh yes, this is how I should sample from it, but that means that you don't actually realize, oh, most of these are the same, I could just do all of them in parallel. And it makes it difficult to have like uh, a memory optimization, etc. Okay, now I would like to talk a little bit as well about compiler correctness because uh, as I mentioned before, it's something that I find very interesting. And uh, when it comes to normal compilers, I guess uh, we've been working compilers for probably 50 years before we started to be interested in compiler correctness. But I think maybe for probabilistic programming, we can right away think about compilers, uh, compiler correctness. Uh, but the first question is, what is it that we want to prove? And I've been in some discussions, especially with people from machine learning, who think that it's impossible. There's nothing we can prove because we do all this estimation, et cetera. And I don't think that's true. So for example, here's the first uh, trial. Uh, try at what is it that we could prove about such a compiler. So let's say that we have a program uh, pi and the query q, and we'll consider some initial state mu. So what is the compiler doing? It's taking our program uh, pi and q, and it's going to produce some code that actually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is, a, is going to be a Markov chain, it's going to be a Markov chain uh, a Monte Carlo algorithm, which has as a Markov chain a stochastic matrix, right? And I will call this matrix pi, uh, P of pi Q. Now, if you consider the total variation distance, and if you're not familiar with this, that's fine. Uh, you just think of it as uh, uh, it's a distance, and as it gets close to zero, that means that our objects are getting closer to each other's. One thing we might want to prove as a starter is that for any program you give me, uh, and any query, there's going to be, uh, if, you, for, if you give me some program and some query, there's going to be a distribution tau, such that regardless of what mu is, the initial distribution, um, overall, as we iterate, as our program uh, go, uh, uh, iterates, the distance between iterating our program and this distribution is going to get close to zero. So this is actually interesting because I think it's doable to prove this, but it's already not completely trivial. You have to uh, formalize a bit of Markov chain theory. If you, for example, have a, a, a finite discrete state, then uh, you might have to prove that the output of the compiler is irreducible and aperiodic, which is already, if you're trying to do mechanical verification, kind of a challenge, but it's doable. At the same time, this is clearly not sufficient, right? Uh, uh, this isn't good enough because basically this statement means that my compiler, if you, if you write a Gaussian mixture model, my compiler is actually free to produce an implementation of LDA for you, right? Because all it's saying is, whatever I produce, it will always converge to the same thing, but it might not be related at all with what you gave me. And there's already a lot of proof to be done just for that. But then obviously, the second step is, well, this is where the semantics comes in. And this is where, so if you think in terms of the transformation, this is a very interesting statement because aside from proving that we have, we're going to converge to an equilibrium, this forces us to actually think about how, how to relate the Markov chain that the compiler produced with the input program and its semantics, right? So ideally what we want to say is that for any program you give me pi with its query q, then the variational distance between iterating my stochastic matrix and the semantics of the abstract syntax I started from uh, is going to go to zero as I iterate. So that's a much more convincing statement. And uh, um, I think it's doable to prove this, but at that point, someone might argue, well, still, like that doesn't match with what we do in machine learning because this is actually converging to the real equilibrium, but in practice, 
we would never do this. We would actually, uh, um, for example, we would not sample from the, the theta and variable. We would compute, we would make a point estimate for them. And uh, that's true. Uh, uh, this is only sufficient. It's not necessary. But I think, actually, I don't have the time to do this. That's another talk. But I think we could go on all day with you actually raising a concern and me actually refining this statement until hopefully we would agree that, yes, it's doable. We can actually prove that a compiler is correct, even when we, uh, you have ton, tons of the tricks that we do in machine learning to make our inference faster. And I really think that uh, um, uh, this is a big challenge, but this is doable, and we could actually build a formally verified prostic program compiler. So I'd like to conclude with, um, I actually have two conclusions. So that's my first slide of conclusion. Uh, uh, just a, a few, uh, what have we learned with uh, Augur version one? Um, I think there were some successes. Uh, for example, it was clear that uh, we could generate very efficient code uh, uh, for uh, either uh, GPU, but also distributed for really non-trivial models and non-trivial uh, um, uh, uh, inference methods. Um, and in fact, we, we actually had a lot of interest because it made it very easy to make good use of the GPU. Uh, the other thing is that um, I feel like reading other papers that have come since then, one of them, maybe one of the things we did right and one of the message we got across was that it's really useful to think carefully about the representation of the program. And I've seen a few other languages where they make mentions about the fact that they actually tried after reading some of our papers, try to think carefully about how they should represent their program in such a way as to making sure that they will be able to produce good code and, and have some idea of what's going on in the compiler. Uh, but there are huge challenges that remain. As I said, the term operating system is unprincipled. Uh, uh, we didn't have a good solution for conjugate relationship. Uh, um, um, and in fact, it's interesting because if you look at the code of JAX, because uh, you might wonder, like, how does JAX generate code for, uh, say, like a Bayesian regression? And because I wonder, like, because our compiler first failed on the Bayesian regression because we were missing a rule for it. So I, I dig into it, and uh, it turns out that there is a hook somewhere that says, oh, if the program looks like a Bayesian regression, do just this, right? <laughs> and it makes sense. So I would like to point out that. Uh, there is a lot, there is more and more, I've seen a lot of people uh, so far in the conference mention each other's works, and it was a lot of machine learning people mentioning the work of other uh, machine learning people. So I would like to highlight three uh, uh, pieces of work. I have nothing to do with them, but I think they're very interesting, and they come from the programming language community. So for example, uh, I'm really fond of this language called Hakaru, which actually tries to address this problem of, of the uh, um, uh, term writing system being ad hoc. Uh, um, and they actually try to use a computer algebra system to address this question in a way that I think is very elegant and very interesting because they also try to work with an array language, which I think if you want performance and GPU code is very important. Another example is Shuffle. Uh, so as I said, in, in this language, uh, uh, we chose everything to be simple, Bayesian network, fixed query, et cetera. But there's a lot of interesting work which happens when you say, okay, what if I have a very powerful uh, a query language and a very powerful inference language, right? Um, and I guess there is one language for this. If you want everything to be Turing complete, uh, uh, the inference language and the query language and the model language, I guess C is a great prostic programming language, but it doesn't give you a lot of insurance about what you're doing. So Shuffle is a very interesting, apparently, yes, and it comes from here, a very interesting language where they try to actually address the question with a really uh, typical PL mindset of, okay, how do we make sure that the inference we're writing actually is somewhat related to the, to the model? And finally, I'm a huge fan of this work called Bayonet, uh, which comes from, I'm not sure, some ETH? Okay, Switzerland, I'm sure, maybe ETH. Uh, uh, and it's a really beautiful example for me of how uh, uh, prostic programming might actually become very popular in the industry. It's a domain-specific language, and it's actually targeted just to configure routers. You can actually describe actually like a, um, a, a routing model, and then all day long the routers collect information, and you can actually condition on all of the uh, uh, traffic that you saw during the day to learn about what's going on and potentially reconfigure the topology and like reconfigure your routers in such a way that uh, uh, the internet will be more efficient. So I think it's a really these are three good examples of of like a, a PL mindset being applied to prostate programming. Uh, and, okay, so that's my real conclusion. So, 
as I said, I, I, was I was trying to have two messages, one for machine learning, and, and it's just that I think it's really useful to not think in terms of big blob of transformation, and also maybe sometimes to think about like white box transformation, and think about this narrowly scope transformation, like say, okay, admit, Gibbs sampling is super important, and it might be just one of one million inference method, but it's a really challenging one, and it's worth studying. Uh, uh, thinking in terms of the increment representations and thinking in terms of correctness, even today, even if it's difficult. And, uh, um, and for compilers, I, I hope that uh, this example about Gibbs shows that uh, there is a lot of work that is typical of prostic programming that we're not used to, but that potentially are very fruitful. And uh, again, uh, I really hope that after giving this talk, a grad student will decide that he wants to spend the next six years actually proving the correctness of a prostate programming language, because uh, I think it's, it's doable. So, uh, uh, just some information. First of all, I wasn't the only one working on this. I had collaborators. I had collaborators from the machine learning group. At that point, I was still working in PL. And, uh, and our, our machine learning oracle was Adam Pocock, who actually is here. And you can talk to him during the break if you want to learn more. And our manager, Steve Green, we work with Guy Steele, which is the guy, one of the guys from Common Lisp, who was interested in this. We work with people from Harvard, Daniel Huang, who actually did a lot of this work, uh, with Greg Morissette. And finally, Joe Tesserotti, who was at CMU. <laughs> Uh, we wrote two papers about this work. One was at NIPS 2014, one at PLDI. I guess we did this early enough that it was fairly uh, reasonably easy to write papers and publish them. And, um, and finally, for the version two of Augur, you can actually find the code. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's all in Haskell, uh, I warn you. Um, but yeah, and I'm done, thank you. Do you have any questions for the speaker? Oh, yes. Yes, actually, um, as long as you have, for example, if you make the restrictions I made, right? I made them because you, you stay in the realm of, of uh, finite uh, discrete probability, which means that eventually, when you want to prove that you converge to equilibrium, you will have to start formalizing Markov chain theory. If it's discrete, if it's finite, it's hard, but it's doable. If you start to have an infinite a number of discrete variable, it's going to be a little more difficult. And once you have continuous variables, not only this, uh, first of all, the Markov chain theory is going to become difficult. You have to start reading mine and Tweedy and worry about phi irreducibility, measure theory, etc. cetera. Uh, and also from a language perspective, if you start to introduce higher functions, I guess it's still, I don't know much about this, but my understanding is that the question about how to give a denotational semantics to a language that has a function is not settled yet. I guess you run into problems with like Borel sets, et cetera. So yes, I think uh, uh, if your grad student decide to tackle this, we need to make sure that he makes the right choices for the input language. Otherwise, it won't take six years, but 60 years. <laughs> uh, th thank you for the talk. I had one question with regard to um, some of the earlier talks today which have a more metaphorical interpretation of compilation. So we have people who are talking about using neural networks to simulate data and then think about compilation as going from the output as, uh, to the original latent variables through a neural net trained in that way. Are there any connections to that, maybe metaphorical compilation, to the PL form of compilation that you've talked about today that could be insightful or useful for the community? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to Frank's talk. The first thing is that Frank didn't actually finish his talk. He only went through one third. And I don't know if he actually reached the part where he wanted to talk about compilation. I'm not convinced about this. So I'm not, I'm not if it's the case that Frank was trying to say that the inference network from amortized inference <laughs> is compilation, then uh, I think it, I really need to talk to him to explain what a compiler is. <laughs> But I, I bet you that actually it's just that, uh, yes, uh, compilation was still coming in the rest of the talk. Uh, but <laughs> it would be possible, for example, if you wanted to do, it's more black box, but if you wanted to do amortized inference, you could actually 
take a compiler uh, approach to it and actually try to uh, uh, compile, uh, because in amortizing friends, so first of all, we actually did a lot of experiments to see whether it would be a good target for our compilers. And so there isn't much to be done when it comes to the inference network, but you still have the model, and you may actually want to, you actually need to sample from the model, and so uh, uh, on that side, yes, there is interesting work to be done to actually compile uh, uh, the model. Thank you. Thank you.